right, we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. Is there anything else, Jennifer, that you need to talk about housekeeping wise? Um, no, just really just if you have not put your name um, and email address in the chat, please do so so that we can get you your credit for this and get you your um, if you're a teacher and then also um, or actually anybody that works in district, go ahead and put that on there so you can get the professional development time and um, just name and email address, please. And then like I said, we have handouts too that we'll be um, emailing after this is over. Right. Good deal. Thank you. So I am not Carla McGee. I think you probably know that. My name is Susan Catlett, and um, I am a consultant to school districts. I've worked with Crosby for many, many years um, with your, your SLC programs and some gen ed, some life skills. And so Jennifer Mitchell is our amazing new behavior specialist, and um, she worked really hard on this presentation. And, and it's about, we're going to talk about sensory needs. But before we get started, I just want to kind of give you a couple of things. We're supposed to go to three today. We will not go after. We'll probably finish up a few minutes early. We will take a break at a natural breaking point. And if you have any, and, and if hopefully we'll do an activity with y'all. Um, if you have any questions about any of the information we're presenting, please feel free to unmute yourself and just ask the question or put it in the chat. And um, I will look at that periodically. So um, like I said, my name is Susan, and I'm excited that we're going to be talking about sensory issues today because lots of kids with autism experience really significant sensory um, intrusions. And is the first slide the video, Jennifer? Okay, so before we start the video, I just want to kind of comment, you know, I've been doing this, this is my 30th year of being a self-employed consultant to school districts in the area of autism. I've been very, very blessed. I love what I do. And um, well, this year it's, <laughs> it's kind of been difficult, but, um, you know, and, and as a behavior analyst, we're always looking at behavior, not in isolation, right? We're always looking at behavior and what surrounds it. And what surrounds behavior are the antecedents or the triggers and the consequences or what happened after the behavior. Consequence in no means means anything negative. It's just what happened after. It could be a reward. It could be attention. It could be ignored it could be anything so and with kids with autism we always ask like if somebody's in a class as a student in the hallway and they're um, doing fine they're walking through the hall with their little hands behind their backs and all of a sudden they're on the ground spinning in circles screaming and spitting and we look at the teacher and we say what happened and a lot of times the teacher or person will say nothing we were just walking in line it, I, I don't even know why He's doing this, something happened, right? And in, in behavior world and in autism world, you kind of have to be um, a detective and to kind of look at the environment, not only for um, things, obvious things, like it's a substitute teacher or, you know, we took a different route or, you know, those obvious kinds of things, or he's got a shirt on with a tag in it that he doesn't like. But you also have to look at some subtle things. And a lot of times the, the antecedent or the trigger is very, very subtle. Hi. And, you know, I have worked with you. Alicia, will you mute yourself, please? Nobody has done that to you today. Meter, will you mute oh. yourself? Oh, sorry. That's okay. Felicia, will you mute yourself, please? Oh, it's not, it wasn't your room. Okay. Um, so anyway, so we have to look at some subtle possibilities. And, you know, I've worked with kids where the color of your shirt makes a difference. I have a young lady that I worked with, and if you wore yellow, she had a horrible day and she would cuss you up a storm. Um, she loved the color pink. She would do anything for anything pink, like a pink rubber band for her hair. Um, but she would cuss you up and down if you wore yellow. And one day the principal was wearing a yellow tie and she cussed him out. And the dad was just mortified because the dad was a pastor. And he kept saying, like, I don't know why she's doing this. I don't use these words at home. Or, you know, it could be that you changed your glasses or you changed your hair or you're wearing a different perfume or you're using a different deodorant. And those subtle things can be really hard to detect because a lot of times, you know, we don't really look at that. We don't look at whether or not your hair is up or down. I had a kid years ago and I don't remember what school district it was. And if the teacher wore her hair down, he was constantly pulling and attacking her hair. If she wore it up in a clip, like I have it, he didn't even he didn't even pay attention to her. So sometimes those those antecedents or triggers can be really subtle. And I wanted you to watch this video and kind of put yourself in in Car Carly's shoes, right? Put yourself in 
Well, I'll just put yourself in Carly's shoes and then we'll talk about it. I haven't looked at anything right now. Yeah. I think there's Grammarly an ad can't first. teach you to dance, but it can help. Can you turn it up? Uh oh. Uh oh. What's happening? There's no volume. Let's just keep it on. There we go. It's not her. It's not. It's not her. It's her. It's her. It's her. <laughs> So I just think I'm going to back it up, Jennifer. Red? Yeah, sure. Are you so I really want them to see this. Thanks. Okay. Here we go. Oh, I can't wait for a coffee. Oh, hello, Brista. What do you girls want? Um, skin soy latte. <laughs> Taryn, soy can't be skim. Hot chocolate, orange juice. No, Dad, I want a coffee. Hot chocolate? Great. So I just think I'm going to Sarah's later. Could you give me a ride? Yeah, sure. Are you cool with taking your sister? Yeah. Wait. What? I have my own plan. I really like that video because you know from an outsider looking in you know how many Home times studio? would pro studio from an outsider looking in that's a great example of where we say nothing happened we were just enjoying our coffee and she just had a meltdown but from carly's perspective there was a lot happening right she wanted coffee her dad didn't give her that in her choice and so uh, she got hot chocolate then her sister wanted to go to her friends and dad wanted her to bring carly and carly had plans whether it was watch a movie or play a video game with somebody who knows and then there were some auditory and visual and olfactory intrusions which you know we know some of our a lot of our kids are hypersensitive to those kinds of things and then there are people staring and then she has a meltdown and turns over the coffee and tries i mean turns over the hot chocolate and tries to get the coffee there was a lot going on Right. But we tend to look at it and go, nothing happened. We were just sitting there having a nice cup of coffee. And so I think it's important for us to look at the, the world from their eyes, um, you know, <clears throat> and really try to understand what could be happening. And there's a lot that could be happening. There could be some, you know, we already talked about that. But um, before we go on with the sensory toolbox, Jennifer and I want you both to all to know that we are not occupational therapists and don't claim to be occupational therapists, but we've learned a lot from OTs. And um, I have some friends in Humble who are, one is an OT, occupational therapist, and one's a behavior analyst, and they put um, a training together about the sensory 
uh, it's called the Sensory Toolbox, and you will have a copy of it. Um, but so that we're going to kind of go through that and talk to you. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. And Jennifer, I'll let you take over. She's doing the video. Jennifer, anything you want to say? No, um, no, not, not at this point. Sorry. <laughs> just, just interrupt me if you do. Just, again, um, anybody else that hasn't signed in um, on the chat, please put your um, name, what campus that you're at, and your email address, please. So what is sensory processing? It's the ability to organize and use information from the senses to produce a meaningful response. So we're receiving information through our senses. We're smelling, we're touching, we're seeing, we're hearing. We have to organize it in our brain and then have some way of getting your, get to interact with the environment. Here's an example. You know, we all have, we joke a lot and we say we all have a little bit of autism and my little bit of autism comes out with loud noises or loud, loud continuous noises. Like I cannot stand leaf blowers. If I'm driving in my car and I have my windows down and there's a truck that's coming up, I have to immediately turn my window, roll my windows up. Yesterday, um, I live kind of in the Galleria area and some uh, power line had gone down and my house still had power, but the apartment building or the hotel net behind my house or my, behind my tiny house, obviously had, it was affected. And so their generator was going and I had the windows open because it was beautiful but I could not stand that sound. So my interaction with the environment was to close the windows, you know, or roll up my window in the car. That's my interaction with the environment. But for a lot of kids with autism, they get, um, they don't, they don't interact with their, they have a hard time organizing this information and have a hard time using it to interact with the environment. And, you know, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about this, but, you know, autism is a neurological disorder and um, we cannot change neurology but we can change behavior and i feel like you know as we go as we are ending 2021 um it's really time <laughs> for us to start understanding trying to understand kids with autism better it's one in 37 boys <clears throat> they're not going away <clears throat> they're coming and they're coming in hard and strong because I've got pre-Kers and kinders. If y'all are elementary, you know, these kids are kicking our, you know, what? Um, so, you know, I, I really like the idea of moving away from autism, um, autism awareness and really moving more toward autism acceptance. And so, you know, I think this will help you guys sort of understand the world from their point of view, because again, you're not going to make them normal. You're not going to make them neurotypical, right? They're going to be neurodiverse. They are will always be because their brains are wired differently. And we know that through lots of research. So it's a neurological disorder and you can't change neurology, but you can change behavior. So Jennifer, chime in anytime you want. <laughs> so sensory strategies really benefit all kids. You know, we were, I was talking with a teacher today about not sensory, but about doing a, um, a little cool down activity um, smelling the flowers and blowing out the candle. Sorry, I'm hot because somebody puts a heater in her office. It's okay. No, I got this. I got it. No, look, I just took my foot off. I'm fine. Um, so, uh, so sensory strategies really benefit anybody. Um, I, you know, heavy work. We talk about heavy work a lot. Um, it facilitates learning. And like I said, I was talking to a teacher this morning and um, we talked about doing I smell the flower, blow out the birthday candles for all the kids in the classroom, not just the kid who's got autism and having problems. Like everybody needs a cool down. Same thing. Everybody needs some sensory input. And um, it is, it, it, it's part of the reticular activating system, the brain structure that's responsible for arousal. And so evidently there's four stages. You're asleep, you're awake, you're alert, and now you're attending. And I think on Friday at whatever time it is, we're probably at the awake stage, <laughs> you may or may not be alert and, and attending, but hopefully you will. Um, but it's the area of the brain that's targeted and, stim and simulated by medication for ADHD, OCD, bipolar, attentional switching and working memory. We all use sensory strategies to increase attention. So I've learned a few things about myself over the last year and a half. And one of the things that I learned about myself is that I have a self-stim behavior. And when I'm stressed or, um, which is you know, pretty frequent, um, I find myself rubbing my finger on my thumbnail. And that's okay, right? Because that's not really intrusive. I can still function and do this. 
The problem is, is when the self-esteem behaviors are this, or this, or spinning in circles, or rocking back and forth. That's where we have to kind of work on, on that. So, but we all have strategies to increase attention. I do this. If I'm in a meeting where I really need to be paying attention, I might have a, um, a therapy ball to kind of pay attention or those little, what are those things called, Jennifer? Poppets? Yes, the poppets. Have y'all seen the poppets? Those are oh. so fun. Anybody I think working with kids these days have poppets. I love them. Yeah. So, so we all have, so think about yourself. You know, think about what kinds of sensory strategies do you engage in? Some people use ball chairs and bounce. Some people, um, like I was in a stool a classroom yesterday, and the teacher only had stools, little little round stools, and I was like, oh no, I'm going to need a chair. I can't I can't sit in this stool because I'd be so focused on balancing on the stool that I wouldn't be paying attention to the meeting. So, you know, does anybody want to share any kind of sensory strategies that you use to increase attention? Again, you can put it in the chat or just uh, unmute yourself. Or not. I always like I when I need to focus, like if I'm going to write a report or something like that, and I've really got to focus. I have to have music like I need some background noise to be able to to focus. So and I'm Isn't that very, funny. And I could never I, write a report with music on. And I'm very ADHD, too. So um, I always tell people I have to like distract one part of my brain so nice. that I so that the other part can focus because I can't have them battling. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Dana, for sharing drawing meditation with classical music. That's so funny, Jennifer, you know, we're all, we all, it's, it's just, we're, a lot of us are very similar and then very different. I have a podcast, it's called Function Junction Behavior Matters, and yeah. my podcast partner, her name is Sissy, and um, we could not be two more opposite, but we work beautifully together, like we're a great team, and so um, anyway, I, I digress. Okay, what's next? All right. Okay. Not five, but seven senses. And we typically just think of sight, sound, taste, and smell. But we really have some central systems, music and chewing gum. Oh, that's a good one. I like that. Um, we used to have, I mean, we actually have seven. We have secondary, which are peripheral, which are the ones that we find most common. And then we have the primary or the central systems. Can I get your podcast info, please? Sure. It's called Function Junction. Behavior matters, and the logo is like a city. It looks like a a city, um, like a kid with his mother, and he's getting all kinds of sensory intrusions. But it's function junction behavior matters. Thank you. Uh, please like and review <laughs> and share your favorite podcast app. Now just played. But we also have other senses: vestibular is our movement, um, tactile is our touch. And then the proprioceptive is the input from the joints and muscles that help you develop body awareness. And that's that heavy work. And a lot of you are already doing this. I know in the classroom I was in this morning, Jennifer had given them great ideas about what were, you, what were some of the sensory ideas you gave them? Because they're doing um, them all. It was a gen ed classroom. For the proprioceptive piece? Yeah. Or, so um, we had a, a crate that he would be... Um, that he would carry it actually had there was not very many kids at that in his class that take their lunch the general idea was that we would have him put like have all the lunches in the crate and he would carry it to and from the lunchroom um, but there's only like maybe two kids that yeah. take their lunch so we put his weighted blanket inside the um crate and then those couple mm -hmm. other blankets there he has a vest he's not real fond of the vest um yeah. but that was but carrying the heavy crate yeah that i didn't mean to interrupt you but i did um that that is uh, heavy work carrying wall push-ups um you also have them he i think y'all are just such y'all do such a good job here um like lift the table a little bit like several times a day he'll just lift the table and that tends to have that grounding effect like it just kind of grounds kid kids i had a young man at a high school in another school district years ago and it was a huge campus it was like a big memorial high school and he had this behavior that we called label diving because he would literally chase girls. Oh, that's okay, good. Um, he would literally chase girls and dive into their pants with his hand to get to see the label. It was very dangerous. He was a big boy, he scared girls and um, it was like high priority and his parents were wonderful and they were experiencing it too. So they couldn't go out. They couldn't go anywhere in the community when he developed this behavior. And it was just one of those things, you know, behaviors come and go. And this was one that came, but we had to get a nip on it. And so we got a shopping cart 
and we weighted it down with, I think, like 100 pounds. And his job initially was to just push the cart down the hall and back and then push the cart down the hall a little bit farther and back. And as long as his hands remained on the cart, he got access to reinforcement. But that was a really important thing to work on. Can you turn that down? That's okay. Here. Is that it? Sorry. Um, lots of distractions. Okay, so he would push that cart, and he it, if he kept his hands on the cart, he was had access to reinforcement. I think it was music, and then we would manipulate it with turning it on, turning it off. He did really well. We didn't use a cart at the home and in the community, but he generalized it. But it was so important because they had self-contained him all day and he was in classroom all day and he needed to get out. And um, they also had a plan. And again, it's a huge Memorial High School, but if he got out, I'll say his name was Tom, they would say uh, over this, the walkie talkies or the speaker system, code T, code, C-O-D-E, T. And all the people that were on the end of the hall with the door leading outside would walk out and block the door. It was a huge community effort, but it was really important. And, um, you know, everybody knew the family and knew him and loved him. He's a cool kid, but he's a big boy and he, you know, he was pretty strong. So that's kind of what I mean, just to kind of ground yourself so that you're getting that input and have body awareness. Okay, so normal sensory integration or typical sensory integration would involve input. Um, and I can't read that. All I taste, my own body move. Yeah, just everything that's coming in, like through all of your yeah. senses. And then, uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to read on there. Yeah, my own body movements, force of gravity, all I hear, all I smell, all I feel, all I see, all I taste is normal sensory integration. The brain does its thing and then kicks it back out. Um, and you're able to learn and attend and interact with others in the environment, um, coordinate your movements, you have good self-esteem, self-control, and you're able to express your feelings. So that's what the normal, um, the normal process would be. And then this next slide is the, the disorganized sensory processing, um, how it kind of goes in and then attempts to come out and just kind of crazy. I mean, you can see um, just it's really interesting. Every time I look at this visual, like I see different stuff um, yeah. in it, you know, but I thought it was a really good visual of um, it is. just kind of how um, processed or how disorganized um, this process is for them. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's really important, Jennifer. Thank you for sharing that visual because Jennifer worked really hard on this handout. I take zero credit. She, like, she gets all the credit, but um, yeah, and I think, you know, looking at that video that we watched in the beginning, that kind of goes right along with that, right? And that's when we say nothing happened, something happened. So I love that. We should probably put, post that up in our classrooms. <laughs> All right. Let's see. What is this? Is the sensory overload? Oh, good. Okay. I'm sure, there's a. Okay, that's fine, Megan. Thank you. Welcome, welcome to today. Today is now, and now you're part of something new. Welcome to Century Overload. This project has been developed to test the Homo sapiens attention span through audio and visual stimulation. Throughout this exercise, the viewer will be exposed to changes in voice, color, and tone, as well as other visual effects to try to break the viewer's concentration. Feel free to choose any of the given elements and to change to a new element at any given point. Enjoy and welcome to Century Overload. Phase one. Concentrate on the sound of my voice. Hmm? Do not pay attention to anything but my voice. My voice is important. It's what you are listening to. Can you hear my voice? Phase two. Concentrate on the sound of my voice. Do not pay attention to anything but my voice. 
My voice is important. It is what you are listening to. Can you hear my voice? Why can't you hear my voice? Pay attention to me. Pay attention to me. Phase three. There is nothing else to do but listen to me. I am your focus. Do not pay attention to anything but me. I am important. You need to focus on me. Why are you not focusing? Why can't you drown the house? Why are you not focusing? That was really good. I've never seen that video. Oh, really? That was really good. This is uh, when I did this training. This was, um, or when I attended this training, that was one of the ones that they used. Why can't I get it to close? <sighs> Sorry, guys. You're good. Do you want to make it till the end? Oh, no, but never mind. Okay. Yeah, that was really good. I, I like that um, video. And uh, it was hard. Why? Right? It was really hard to focus. I was really trying to. And it was like, I kind of wanted to cover my ears. Um, if you ever want to feel like you can get, you're getting inside the head of a person with autism, look at or consider reading The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. It is very, very good. It's, again, it's called The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. And I don't remember the author, but I think it's Dan somebody, but how many books are titled that? But they came to town, they had a play and they came to town and it was a kind of that experience like that. Like it was lights and sounds and my friends and I were there and I was just like blown away about how these kids respond to the environment you know and it was hard for me to respond um is that where we are jennifer yes okay so abnormal responses to sensory input might cause the student to become under aroused and this has this is a kid who has a very high neurological threshold causing them to be under responsive or hyposensitive to input meaning they're kind of like an eeyore right and then we have kids who might be overwhelmed and they have a low dot neurological threshold causing them to be over responsive or hypersensitive to input. And I think for me in the area of auditory, I'm overwhelmed with easily by leaf blowers and you know generators and loud trucks and everything. But I might be under aroused um, to things like taste. You know, I've got a really high threshold um, for taste. And so I tend to like things spicy and salty um, because, you know, so you're not the same in every area, right? You're under, you could be under or overwhelmed in different areas. With, so children with either type of sensory processing deficit are not able to use sensory information adequately in order to make meaning, re meaningful responses or to develop more complex skills. This type of dysfunction will have a profound effect on the child's ability to participate in the educational environment perform tasks, express emotions, and accept social interactions. So you can see, you know, there's a reason why our kids struggle. And, you know, I really encourage teachers and teachers and paras and school psychologists and speech pathologists, and OTs and PTs, please don't look at this as a behavior issue, right? It don't assume it's just bad behavior because there's nobody wants to be, have bad behavior. Nobody, no kid in this, no person on this planet wants to have a meltdown right? No person on this planet wants to um, engage in aggressive behavior. There's a reason for it. And yes, it's problematic. And yes, we need to get it under control. But there's a reason the behavior is happening. Okay. And so, you know, I just encourage you not to just write it off as, oh, he's a behavior kid. It may be, they may be, but it may be for a reason. And it's very highly likely with a kid with autism, it could be a sensory purpose. Now, do kids get hit on purpose? Of course, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is there's a reason to it. Jennifer, anything else? Nope, not on that. I think yes. Yeah. Okay, so what are your sensory quirks? I've told you some of mine. Um, and quirks only become deficits if they interfere with your ability to participate in life, perform daily tasks, and learn. So I have sensory quirks. I've told you some of mine, right? But it doesn't interfere with my life. It just... I, I cope, I roll up the windows or close the windows or go in another area of the room where they're not right next to my window blowing leaves, you know, like I, we all have quirks. 
So be thinking about, you know, does anybody want to share either in the chat or unmuting yourself what some sensory quirks are that you might have? Ms. Greer? Did I raise my hand? <laughs> oh, I, I saw you were unmuted, so I thought maybe you wanted to share. Deanna? I, I, didn't, mean, I didn't mean to unmute. I'm sorry. That's okay. You're okay. Deanna? Sure, I'll share. So um, this year I've had the luxury of doing all three pre-K cafeteria duties. <laughs> Oh my god. And gosh. those babies will they love to play with that table handle and it's just like bang, 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 clank, clank, uh -huh. clank. It's like, for me, it's like nails down a chalkboard. Yeah. I'd rather hear that than and I don't know what it is. So, but I got out my megaphone and we we eliminate the behavior from happening, but it's it's every day. It's every day. Yeah, I cannot <laughs> stand middle uh, cafeterias. Middle school cafeterias are the worst. Um, but somebody said, I can't stand the sound of poppets. That's so funny. That cracks me up because oh, I love no. poppets. <laughs> um, who else? Anybody else want to share? Cafeterias are horrible. Um, the squealing of the, of the speaker when it comes on, it can be very intrusive. I had a kid in middle school who was fine in the cafeteria, like just fine. It was so loud, awful. And he's eating away, eating away. And somebody turned on the mic and it squealed and he went to choke me. And then as soon as it stopped squealing, he was fine. But, you know, we, some people might go, oh my God, he just tried to choke her. Well, no, it was him trying to say like, get me out of here. Or I had Cody as a little boy years ago, I worked with he and his brother, him and his brother and his mom. And I had the brilliant idea of going into a, the brand new Kroger over at um, Wallaceville in uh, Normandy. And um, that was the worst idea I'd ever made because I'd ever had because it was brand new and the lights were really bright and it was really clean and shiny. And we happened to enter the door where the self checkouts were. And so it was bing, 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 bing. And Cody had behavior, you know, he did pull hair and he had, he had some behavior, but he was never the kind of kid who would like literally grab you by the neck. And so we walk in and I'm thinking to myself, oh, this is kind of overwhelming for me. And all of a sudden Cody looked at me and he was shorter than me. But he grabbed my neck and he had this look on his face like, please, dear God, get me out of here. And I did. And we sat at the bench on the bench outside Kroger while mom and her brother, his brother shopped. And he was this loving, normal, kind self, you know, rubbing on me and obviously trying to say I'm sorry. Um, but it just happened, you know, and, and I, if it were me, I could say, yeah, I think this is a little too much right now. I'm going to come in and back another time. But Cody can't do that. He's nonverbal. So, um, anybody else want to share your quirks? Do you have any quirks? I'll say know. something. This probably yeah. going to get a lot of people. Uh, constant dog barking drives me up the wall. Like, you I have my hard time tuning it out. And a lot of people have dogs now. <laughs> so, it's, it's very hard for me to focus and do what I need to do when there's a lot of dog barking. It's constant. Yeah. You would hate my, my neighborhood because my dog is my officer, Bo. And he's constantly protecting and serving by looking out all the windows and barking at anybody that walks by. And then Blossom, who weighs six pounds, she doesn't get off the couch, but she's his deputy because she doesn't stop. She barks too, but she doesn't know why. And it starts up with the whole neighborhood. So I, I'm, that's, a, that's a tough one. Um, headphones might help, Shadrina, I don't know. Yeah. I, I've barking. tried, I can't, I can't do it with everything, but I have tried that too. It's, yeah. it's hard. I, it makes, it just, uh, I, I, it just bothers me. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. And it just depends, you know, it's not always the volume. It's sometimes it's the pitch and the tone of it. Right. Um, yeah. And somebody said, I tap all the time. That's, uh, that's a good, that's a sensory quirk, but it's good. It works. It works for you. And that's what we have to do is find things that work for us. And I think when we um, ask kids with autism, and, sorry, we ask kids with autism to go in these environments and we don't give them tools or strategies like headphones, like the weighted down basket, like the weighted, blank, the weighted blanket or the heavy, the weighted backpack, the, I think that's almost unfair, right? Um, to expect them to be okay or typical when we don't give them tools, you know, just like you and I, you you don't like the sound of dogs. And so I don't like the sound of those things that I told you about. And so, you know, we all have coping ways, strategies to cope, but then we expect kids on the spectrum to just go in the cafeteria and not have any behavior or the gym. Or the, but again, it's not always volume. It could be the pitch or the tone. Slurping of coffee. Slurping of coffee is Kathy. I mean, Carla's, that's her quirk. 
I hate it. Just can't stand it. I can't stand if I'm at a restaurant and people are like scraping their plate with a fork oh. and knife, like cut, 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 ding, 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 ding. I'm like, oh, it's like it's uh, nails on a chalkboard. Anybody else want to share? All right. Well, well they're more like, like um, smells, different smells that are just, I cannot with with some different smells and then but I know some people too that like texture I'm just trying to think of like the other senses um but I my nephew-in-law has an issue with cotton balls <laughs> I just think I don't know it's not funny but it is because it's so random and he everybody likes to tease him about it um but yeah he cotton balls so, somebody else just said cotton balls yeah, like he, so, oh, and somebody else said I can't do it either I, I never I had never heard of that until he had this like aversion to it and I thought that was crazy I was like what but yeah it's it's a it's thing a few people here and then I know somebody else with balloons um it was a teacher across the hall from me one time and we were blowing up balloons for something and she came in and uh, oh, turned around and walked right back out she's yeah, like nope. yeah yeah. yeah, this when your socks come off, the heels of your sock come off in, in under your shoe, while you're in your shoes, that makes me crazy. I was just thinking about something. Um, this, oh, yeah, I'm a very sensory person. My great niece is too. And I was telling Jen, my niece was saying that Emma, her daughter, would just prefer to go around naked if she want, you know, if she could. And I said, God, she's a, she's a catlet. I said, she's her aunt's daughter or aunt's great niece. And she was like, what? Do you do that too? And I said, I, I put it, keep it together all day. But the first, well, after I take my dogs out, the first thing I do is put on cozy sweats and a comfortable t-shirt um, and take, you know, I just, I, uh, I can't send, I want my jewelry off. I just, oh, I just, I can't wait to go home tonight and sit in with sweatpants and a big puffy sweater and socks. Like that sounds so fun to me. Somebody just posted something and I missed it. What was it? Noise to fall asleep. I'm the same way. Megan. Some people need noise. Yeah. Like Jennifer needs noise to do a report. There's no way I could write a report. So we all have quirks. You know, we say we all have a little bit of autism. That's our little bit of autism. But the difference is it doesn't qualitatively impact our ability to cope. And that's the that huge difference. You know, when I do trainings in person, a lot of times people come up to me at break and they'll say one of two things. They'll say either, I think I'm on the spectrum. Or more commonly, they'll say, I think my husband's on the spectrum. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I tell them this, the same thing is that qualitative impact, you know, like I get through it. I don't, I don't, it doesn't ruin my day to have leaf blowers, you know, it's annoying, but it doesn't ruin my day. I get over it. I need complete darkness and silence. And I don't like open doors and cabinet doors, same here. This is so interesting. Yes, I'm the same way. Oh my gosh, I'm the same way. But it's that qualitative impact, right? So I know a man who's on the spectrum and he gave this example. He said, you know, when you're trying to call a company and if you want this, press this, if you want this, press this, if you want this, press this, and we press zero to try to get a human, you know, and it bugs us, but we get over it. He said that can ruin his whole day. So it's that qualitative impact that makes us a little bit, have a little bit of autism, but not enough because we can get through it. We have coping strategies and people on the spectrum don't. Okay, go ahead. So everyone's sensory system is unique like a fingerprint. I love that. There's no cookie cutter answer. Trial and error to see what works for that child. Like Jennifer was talking about the basket, weighted down basket. He was carrying it and then he just got sick of it. And so he threw it. So they're not having him carry it anymore. Um, so again, I've kind of been talking about this throughout the session, the, the day, this it's quirks versus deficits. It's quirky versus qualitative impairment, right? Um, if it's a deficit, if it's quirky, you know, it's quirky, it is, we all have quirks. But if it's a, a deficit, you really wanna collaborate. And like I said earlier, Jennifer and I are not OTs, but I've learned a lot from OTs. And, you know, back in the day, I'd say maybe 15, 20 years ago, I kind of feel guilty because we really didn't consider the sensory piece in autism. We were just trying to change behavior. So it was like, stop kicking, stop screaming, stop hitting, stop biting, stop this, blah, blah, blah. And we really didn't think about well, maybe they're doing it because there's some sensory intrusions. Hmm. And we're really just starting to learn more about it. And, you know, I think it's funny because I'm a behavior analyst and I have heard other behavior analysts say, well, we're not going to talk about sensory because it's not research based. And I always just shake my head because I don't know about the research. I haven't done enough research to find out about the research. But my answer or response is, I don't know if it's research based or not, but I've seen it work. I've seen it have huge impacts on our kids. And so 
you know, um, but I know some hardcore behavior analysts that say, oh no, there's no research to that. It's not a research-based strategy. I teach a, sometimes teach a course, graduate course in applied behavior analysis at Arizona State. And it's um, to get your behavior analyst certification. Anyway, there's a lot of kids on there. And I say kids, cause they're like in their twenties, um, just graduated from undergrad and now they're getting their masters. And, you know, they say that, oh, I have to tell the OT on my clinic at my clinic that I can't do that because it's not a research-based strategy. And I'm like, oh gosh, people will get over it. Anyway, <laughs> thanks Jennifer. It works. Okay, go ahead, what? I just said it works. I don't know why you would, why anybody would be against it. Like when you I've, it works so many times. I've seen, yeah, it, it, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, so we talked about the EOR, you know, the under high threshold, they're under aroused. And then we talked about the low threshold, they're overwhelmed. So like the puffer fish. Um, and then we have, do they, so if they have a high threshold, they react passively. Some kids react actively to counteract the level of, the level of arousement. Some kids with a low threshold are overwhelmed, react passively. And those are the hardest kids in my mind to deal with, the passive kids, because you can't find anything they're willing to work for or they're avoiding. And I see, I see a lot of kids on the spectrum that are the Eeyores. I see a lot of twig, twig uh, tiggers. I see a lot of kids who are, have o overwhelmed. And so they just kind of would rather sit in the corner, which is hard, that's a blowfish. And then we have a lot of kids who run and they may be that they're overwhelmed and they're trying to um, reacting actively. So think about, you know, your kids, um, think about your kids with autism and, and try to, you know, if you're with a colleague or if you're with yourself, think about what, where your kid fits in. Is it he a low registration, under aroused or high registration? I mean, I'm sorry, actively seeking, under aroused or sensitive, because low threshold and overwhelmed, or are they active like the road runner? So just be thinking about that. Jennifer, what would you say the kiddo was when we, that we saw this morning? Oh, you know, it's funny because I was thinking about him a lot when I was putting all this together. And I think he's kind of a combination. Like when we start kind of going through this, I think we'll see. Um, because I can see, and that's what I think is interesting about this. Um, and what I really like about the sensory toolbox too, because it ultimately, it kind of gives you a cheat sheet on some yeah. things to try for these kids. So like when it, um, and you'll see, like, as we go on and talk about these more, um, we give that to you as well, but it tells you like, you know, if you're seeing these things, you know, if they're, if they are like the Eeyore, um, this is what you see. Um, and these are some things to try. Um, <coughs> so I, I don't know. There's, I, I see different pieces. Yeah, I would say what I saw this morning was really more uh, Tigger. Yeah. But and a I, little bit of a little bit of Roadrunner, but mostly Tigger. But I wasn't there for very long. You know him a lot better than I do, obviously. Yeah. So, yeah, those are, I mean, those are the, the two that I pretty much see, too. Um, so it's just, it's interesting. What, yeah, and I love what we're going to present to you next, because this is the, it's the cheat sheets, right? Well, and I so think the next. Yeah, the next one kind of gives a little bit more description okay, okay, on sorry. each of these um, individual categories. Okay, thank you. So the Eeyores of the world means they have a very passive strategy. So for example, they're uninterested, they're kind of self-absorbed, flat affect, don't miss, don't notice what's going on around them, miss cues that might guide their behaviors. Um, why? Because most events in daily life don't contain a, su a sufficient amount of intensity to meet these children's thresholds, making them somewhat oblivious. Intervention, increase the intensity of sensory input to improve the chances for noticing and responding to environmental demands. So this is a low registration, high threshold, passive kind of kid. It kind that of reminds me of like, I, I kind of think of like Sheldon um, a little bit with this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, just the self-absorbed, flat affect, you know, um, I kind of think of him when I think of Eeyore, um, you know, from Big Bang. Yeah, Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory. Yeah, that's a good, yeah. He yeah. is. We have a lot of, I see a lot of Eeyores in some of our special aid classes too. Just kind of, doo -doo -doo, you know, just kind of there. Yeah. And that's why. Yeah. So what's the next one? Okay. And I see a lot of Tiggers in pre-K and kinder, and they may not be on the spectrum. Um, 
but you know, these are kids that have a very th high threshold. So they're seeking input, they're seeking input. And so you're gonna see kids who enjoy and generate extra sensory input, very active, continuously engaging, excitable. Um, why? They're engaging in active act strategies to increase input as a means to meet the high threshold. And some uh, interventions might be giving more opportunity for the desired sensory input within the daily activity. So they don't disengage in order to get what they need to stay alert. So we do a lot of walk breaks with Tiggers. We do, you know, people will say, he's running out of the classroom. Where's he running to? Uh, the nurse's office. Great, then let's have him walk to the nurse's office and deliver notes. We can have walk breaks throughout the day, gen ed or special ed. Um, you know, where people will say, he'll run. He runs out of the classroom. Where does he run? He runs to the gym. Okay, what's in the gym? Well, we go to the gym and there's an older campus. And so there's a gym, huge garage door and he wants to turn open and close the garage door. Well, guess what? There are YouTube videos of door, doors, garage doors opening and closing. So let's let him work for the garage door videos, right? So, you know, when I hear kids are running, kids are, there's a reason for it. Let's figure out what they're trying to get in and get out of, getting out of it and give it to them, right? Jennifer, any thoughts on the Tigger? Okay. Uh, no, that was, I mean, I, I like that example of the garage door that, I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah, as people, I think I think people spend so much time blocking doors and not letting them out. Blah, 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 you know, whereas um, now with the kid I talked about, Tom, he would run on to a very busy free uh, highway. But you know, kid people talk about kids running and and like yesterday was it yesterday? Yeah, yesterday I was in a small school di district north of here, and um, <laughs> they have a train. And it's not on schedule in the town. It's not on schedule. And then the kid hears it and he's got very hypersensitive hearing. He leaves the classroom and he just stands and it's fenced in, thankfully, in the, in the, you know, the area around the portable. But he leaves the portable and just goes and stands there inside the fence for the train. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so that teacher has to completely stop teaching because this is a gen ed classroom and then she's got to go make sure he's safe. But then the other kids aren't safe. Like, no. We've got to, he can't, we've got to do something to modify the environment so that he can't get out that door. Right. Um, he can look, watch from the window, but he can't get out that door. Um, so these are kids, now the blowfish are sensitive, low threshold. They have a passive strategy. So you're going to see kids who detect more input than others. Um, hyperactive, distractible, complainers, notice many more sensory events that others do than others do and frequently comment about them. Like, um, you know, seeing a ray of light come in, you know, how rays of lights come in classrooms and, and through windows, they'll comment on things like that. And why do they do this? They have very low thresholds that enable them to have a high rate of noticing what's going on around them and allow things to happen and comment rather than remove themselves. Provide more structured input so that the person does not become overwhelmed in everyday life. I can't think of, I can't think of anybody that reminds me of this. I have, um, there was, when I was observing um, at a campus um, a while back, there was a little girl who um, has not, there, she had some stuff going on and I wasn't actually there observing her, I was observing another student and I, she, she was this, this was her all day long. She was like super whiny, the noises everybody else was, everything that everybody else was doing was bothering her. Um, and I mean, then her jacket couldn't zip up right. They were loud. They were doing all the things. Um, yeah, yeah. Super sensitive. Um, and at first I kind of thought it was just, maybe she was sick or wasn't feeling good. Maybe she's yeah. whiny. But then I was like, as I was, again, reading through all this last night, I was like, ah, maybe she's got some sensory yeah. stuff going on. Yeah. You know? she, I mean, we all do, right? Yeah, we, absolutely. And so, yeah, that, that I thought of this little girl, um, that little girl, whenever I was, doing this one yesterday I was like mm, yeah I could see her being low threshold yeah yeah, yeah. interesting yeah. yeah that's interesting and then the last one is Roadrunner and this is a kid who avoids they have a very low threshold so they have an active strategy so this is the kid who's bothered by mo input more than others rule bound ritual driven uncooperative engaging behaviors to limit out the input um, covering their ears putting their head down, putting their head the hoodie over their shirt, limited sensory, why limited sensory opportunities because unfamiliar sensory input is difficult to understand and organize and may cause fight or flight. Rituals provide a high rate of familiar sensory input while 
simultaneously limiting the possibility of unfamiliar input. Make input less available um, so that the student does not become overwhelmed and want to withdraw from participation in everyday life. And you guys have all seen the high schoolers and the middle schoolers who have their hoods on, their heads on the desk. You know, that's the kid, but, but they're answering every question correctly or they're getting 100s on their test. Those are the kids that drive the teachers crazy because, you know, he doesn't participate in class. Well, he, maybe he is and you just don't know it, right? Or I was in the gen ed classroom and here I am, like I'm supposed to be the autism person, right? And I'm in this generally classroom and um, the teacher's up front and the kids are all facing the teacher and the kid I was there to see was just pacing in the back of the room, pacing. And I'm like, I go, doesn't that drive you crazy? And she was like, nope. He, he hears everything. He gets everything. He answers questions. The kids are used to it. They can't see him. And that's what he needs. And I felt so bad because I was supposed to be, you know, like the autism lady's coming. And I'm like, doesn't that drive you crazy? So, um, so yeah, so that's that kid, you know, and, and this teacher was really great. She was like, no, he, he get, hears it. And that's what he needs to learn. So it's all good. So those are the four kinds. Uh, Jennifer, do you have any examples of roadrunners? Um, yes, the, especially the, the rule um, bound ritual driven. Um, I worked with a kid that was a, a fourth grader, like a lot of perfectionists and our little yes. guy we saw this morning had this perfectionist with them, um, issues. Um, the anxiety I, I would see a lot with, with the roadrunner type kiddos yes um because of that rule bound like when other people are not following the rules this is I, for me this is um like at in secondary level you see this um these kids being triggered a lot when they're substitute teachers not yep. because it's, not because it's a change in person they handle the change in person fine it's the way that every all the other students acted when yeah. that change of you know of like they're not following the rules now the teacher's not here yeah. they're not doing what's supposed to be done they know better <laughs> and yeah. it causes everything to um kind of go awry so yeah. um yeah i've seen i've seen this one um they're, they're good um, hall monitors, right? Because yes. they like rules. They follow the rules. They know they report when people break the rules. And a lot of times we have to do training or teaching on what's the difference when a little rule is broken, broken versus a big rule, right? So the kid who wants to tell on everybody that he didn't have his pencil today where, you know, I really don't care. That's, that's, a, that's a small rule. Um, but I do care if the kid bashes in the um, fire, but kid, you know, gets the fire extinguisher out or the fire alarm, pulls the fire alarm. Um, yeah, and, and these are the kids that just rarely seem relaxed, right? They're always just kind of, and I, I feel like a lot of the kids that we work with are like this. It's like fight or flight, fight or flight, fight or flight, because they don't know what's coming at them. And so, you know, Temple Grandin, if you don't know who she is, I would look her up. But she talks about how she was always fight or flight until she got on um, medication for anxiety and depression. Yeah. But, you know, it's just kind of like, you know, I'm kind of thinking like, well, never mind. I'll, I'll move. I'll move on. I had a kid um, real quick that was a, a fifth grader, and he had some severe anxiety, and he was very much this um, low threshold kind of guy, and his anxiety was causing like like stomach issues. Like, but then he was very opposed to using the bathroom at school. Yeah. Um, and so that was a whole thing. And so we had worked it out where he could use one of the faculty restrooms, but y'all, it was a faculty restroom and he's a student. So he's not supposed to use that bathroom. He know because, you know, he's a rule follower and that's yeah, yeah. Not, not faculty. So it took a, like, it was a lot of work to let him know that that was an okay thing for him to do. I think we actually ended up putting up a sign <laughs> for him, like a visual, um, so that he knew that it was, he was allowed also to use this restroom. Um, yeah, yeah, I love that. Just so much, so um, just rule bound that he couldn't do anything else, so. That's a good story. That's a really good story. Yeah, that's funny. So this is the part that I love. And um, Jennifer, tell me what you think. I was thinking we could take, well, let's go through it and then we'll have them take a break and then do it for one um, of their kids. This actually may be a good place to take a break, um, Susan, because they've got, the, there's like seven of these. So it would take a little bit to get okay, through. Okay, let's so. go ahead and take about a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and we'll probably take another break or do an active activity. Okay, so, so we'll see you back here at 1.13. Thanks.
Oh, welcome back. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Um, need for clarification? Um, I have not been keeping up with the chat. So if anybody chatted something, please do it again. Um, otherwise, we'll go ahead and get started. No questions. All right. So now we're going to talk about the different seven senses that we talked about earlier. And I know Jennifer's going to have, likes to talk about this. And so I might let her, I'll probably just let her talk and I'll might chime in. Is that okay, Jennifer? Sure. All right. So um, this is actually kind of what you guys are going to get um, when we, yeah. um, when we send it out. And so you will have, and there's a lot more on here. I just picked a couple of things um, to, yeah. kind of, to show you guys what it looks like. Um, but it's, it's really neat. Like I said, this is kind of like the cheat sheet um, that I like to use um, whenever I start identifying, you know, kind of where the kid is, if they're um, high threshold or low threshold, um, and then what to do. So it gives you, so this is like for tactile, it gives you the um, different behaviors. So if you're seeing things like they don't like to be held, they but they like the, like the deep hugs. Um, they like that soft touch though. That's not something that they like. They're... Um, they're fearful it's like cotton balls yeah like the cotton you know? balls. right yeah. so some different things to try for that are the weighted items vest lap pads um the shoulder snake baseball cap um any kind of deep pressure um into the palms weight bearing on the hands um but then the thing says never force activities respect the need to withdraw do not elicit the fight or flight response okay so um whenever i did this training i was just telling um susan about this whenever i did this training they had some videos um, that went along with it. And I wish I had those to share with you guys, because it's really neat to see the different reactions that um, people have to this. So um, the videos that they showed was somebody that has like a high threshold and it, you know, that snow, that fake snow stuff, that's kind of slimy. Mm -hmm. I love of, it. You know, there's some kids, the first video that they showed had um, a high threshold and so he's like, he's all playing in it and just, just going crazy with it, just loving it. Mm -hmm. And then the other student had a low threshold. He did not want to, he did not want to touch it. He did put his hand in. And then when he realized what it was, y'all, he gagged. Like he's like literally like about to throw up because he could not get away from it fast enough. So it was just, it was crazy to me that it got that kind of response from him. That's how, um, how, you know, he, he processed it. So, okay, so then um, let me say one thing. I was doing yeah. a home visit years ago when, before COVID, and the kiddo. So, you'd walk, so to get to the house, it was like an, an apartment, like a townhouse where the car was in the garage. And then, so you'd walk in and walk up the steps, and that was their living area. And he had like a little office right next to the step the stairs. 
and his mom and dad and I were talking and somebody else were talking and he was kind of doing his own thing. And when I left, I was behind him and I was like, okay, see you later. And he went, I, I tapped him like that. And he went like that. And I was like, oh my gosh, that would be a low threshold. Right. I am very high threshold when it comes to touch. I love like when I get my hair colored or yeah, my hair colored when they shampoo and they give lots of pressure. Oh my God. I love that. Um, so yeah, so we all have our quirks. Go ahead. Yeah. And that's, I'm like that too. Like I am more of a high thrust threshold type of person. I like, um, you know, I like, I have a wetted blanket that I use, um, <laughs> at home. Like I, all of these things, um, mm-hmm. I think once we start going through all these, everybody kind of starts to self-diagnose themselves. This is like, this will really point out some of your own quirks. <laughs> Um, as we go through this. So, but the high threshold, some of the behaviors that you'll see are just, they crave touch, um, need to touch everyone and everything around them. You may see some like self-interest type behaviors, the pinching, biting, uh, banging on head. Um, some frequently, and see, this is where I was thinking about my friend the other day, frequently hurts other children or pets. Yes. Things, so unintentionally, but like being like too aggressive, yes. too active, and they're not realizing because their sensory input is different um, yes. than what the typical student is. So yes. uh, a couple of interventions for that would be just to try the finger paint, painting, um, free play with like a rice box or one mm-hmm. of the sand box, Play-Doh, that kind of stuff. Um, I thought some of these were interesting rolling around on grass or carpeted surface. Huh. Um, interesting. Okay. I know I thought like, you know, but then when you think about it, it's your body weight that yeah. you know, is, is rolling and then you're getting that sensory. I thought that was neat. And then draw on the carpet, um, or on the chalkboard and then erase it with your hands. So, <gasps> That's a good one. Yeah. You know, they That's have those, really those big one. rugs, you know, that are very yes. like the all ply or whatever, you know, drawing in that and then just doing that those sensory pillows that like with the sequins that go up and down those types of things would be easy to implement in the classroom so um there's a lot for the tactile um and then a whole lot more that on what you're going to get than what's on here yes yes yeah but those are i love the idea of the carpet and wiping it with your hands that's a great idea let me let me say one thing about um the the touch going back we were leaving a campus today in the um ec that people SL structure learning teacher came in and she said, oh, I didn't have any questions earlier, but I did. I do have a question now. And she was showing me this little guy that comes in and he, he spits and taps his hand. He claps like a cheerleader. So it's really loud. And he hits his, ta- you know, his little cube chair and he hits surfaces. And she thought that it was for touch. And so it might be. And so we had talked about, you know, maybe that's the kid who, um, oh, will you go back to the other one tactile real quick? Oh. Sorry. Otherwise. Yeah. So maybe he, so that kid could be a high threshold. And so we had talked about, you know, I like these ideas, but we'd also talked about like having a sensory board, like a, just a piece of cardboard with like um, soft, rough, soft, um, like Velcro, both sides of the Velcro, the soft and the hard and maybe sandpaper or just different things that he could, that he, he could have with him as a replacement. Um, and I'm hoping she's going to watch this because I know she'll, mm-hmm. You know, oh, she does have the sensory toolbox. I had given it to her years ago and she still has it. And so she's going to look at that. But I just thought about that today because um, I thought about that when you're talking about that because it happened today. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Sorry. All right. The next one is the auditory uh, processing. So this is the hearing. So the things, um, the low threshold. So distracted by sounds that are not nor- normally noticed by others. So that's like your lights that are humming, the computers that are like making that noise, um, buzzing noises, the clocks ticking. Um, they're frequently People talking outside. Right. <laughs> Leaf blowers, <laughs> right? Uh, frequently ask people um, to quit or stop talking or stop singing. Um, runs away or cries. Um, covers ears when loud or unexpected noises. And then um, I thought these were interesting too. May decide whether they like a certain person by the sound of their voice. Absolutely. So yeah, Absolutely. some people they didn't say or do anything. It's just the sound of their voice or their tone of their uh, the voice that is. Um, just adversive to them. All right. So uh-huh. some different things that you can try for this is, you know, keeping um, distractions to a minimum, keep doors closed to the hallways, cover some windows. Um, you can mm-hmm. use rugs or carpets um, to help, you know, and hanging stuff on walls, all of those kind of things that um, 
help decrease noise. I never felt my, that I was really a low threshold person until um, we flooded in Harvey and ripped out all of our carpet and put in tile, <sighs> which I thought was a great idea at the time because it'd keep it cleaner, but I have three boys. So oh my gosh. It's very loud in my house. My yeah. House all the time lots of rugs lots of rugs lots of rugs yeah yeah um and and I know people like that like I was <laughs> I'm gonna give myself up I was in the classroom yesterday the teacher's fabulous really really good teacher I love her to death but she talks so loud and I like she's I mean but I was like like kind of trying not to show that I was plugging my ears because um, and kids are like that too, you know, they, they truly decide if they like people based on the way they smell or the way they sound, or, you know, not really the way they look, but the other senses really impact their choice of preferred people. Yeah. Go ahead. So some other things, um, use little to no verbal information. So using gestures and your just your visual picture cues for directions and things like that. Um, and then also just, you know, using the earmuffs or any kind of noise canceling headphones. But then sometimes that can be a, a tactile thing too, that they're, you know, um, that they don't like that. So, um, and those- Let me say one thing about that, Jennifer, because I hear that a lot. I'll say, well, he wears headphones. No, he won't tolerate them. Well, of course not, right? He has autism. So we have to teach it. Yes. And it's really worth the work. And with the way you do that, there's lots of different ways. But one way that I've done it is starting with like um, uh, a headband, you know, that you wear over your ears when it's cold outside, like if you wear it skiing, start with that and reinforce tolerating it for so many seconds. And then I might move to uh, a loose baseball cap, right? And then, no, probably not that. Maybe I would move to the the thing around your ears plus some uh, of those really cheap headphones that used to get on planes you know and reinforce 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 and then I would slowly move to you know different kinds of headphones until they can tolerate the head noise counseling it's really worth the work I had a mom who was pretty much a prisoner in her own home and um, she did the shaping procedure but she did it differently she used this is so funny she used a dish towel and as long as the kid tolerated the dish towel on his head he got access to his reinforcer and then she went to her husband's baseball caps that were too big. And then she went to different kinds of things. I don't remember the whole sequence, but she, she, it took a long time, but it was worth the work because she could now go to Walgreens or CVS or a restaurant. Um, so yeah, the, most kids won't wear headphones when you first put them on, but a lot of, well, some kids will, I shouldn't say most. Some kids will, some kids won't, but it's worth the work is all I'm trying to say, sorry. That's okay. All right. So then um, those kids that have the high threshold, that means, you know, they need more. So the behaviors for that, that you're going to see is they're not really responding when their name is being called. Um, they make noise for noise sakes. You know, that's like, just a lot of that, like, just like it, involuntary, like just noise, like for nothing. Um, yeah. The music or the TV being super loud, um, talks to self uh, through a task out loud so um there's a i've seen a lot of that um and then a lot of times just appears oblivious when something's going on around them um loud sounds whatever train going by they're just like in their own world still um so uh, some interventions for those guys are the headphones with music um, I thought this was cute. The shoe squeakers with the noisemakers, the horns or whistles in them. Um, I, you know, I think those shoes are so cute. I'm, my kids never had them. That might annoy me, but <laughs> with me being more of a low threshold um, person, but it could be beneficial for them. So music during study time, that's, that works well for me. Um, just noisy toys. Um, and then making sure that you're pairing verbal directions with gestures or visual cues um, for clarity. All right, our next one is uh, visual processing. So um, the low threshold, the types of behaviors that you're gonna see are like the sensitive um, to the bright lights. Um, a lot of times they'll cover their eyes, they'll rub their eyes, they may get a headache from the lights. Um, easily distracted by other visual stimuli in the room. Um, yeah, um, I'm like that. Um, Me too, I, I have to have sunglasses off. Yeah, I thought this one was interesting too. The the avoids eye contact. Um, I thought this was interesting because it's specifically under the low threshold for visual processing. But that's something that we kind of categorize a lot as just a AU um, type of behavior. But I thought it was interesting that it falls specifically under this visual processing, um, low threshold visual visual processing. Yeah, and and don't don't get hung up on eye contact. People with autism have told us that if they 
um, give, have to look directly at the person that makes them sick to their stomach. I had a little boy named Matthew and I said, Matthew, why don't you look at people when they're talking to you? And he goes, because it looks like your face is melting. And I was like, okay, let's take that goal off his IEP, shall we? You know, um, so don't get hung up on con contact. It's hard for kids on the spectrum. It's often, often hard for them to look and listen at the same time. So just really focus more on looking in the direction of the speaker because I have a colleague who is in his 30s and he was a victim of look at me training, right? So the teacher would hold up a reinforcer, look at me, look at me, look at me. And now he stares. And if you think about it, maintaining eye contact for more than three, two or three seconds gets really creepy, right? Yeah. So like you watch yourself at lunch and you're staring at somebody and they're like, it's creepy. Um, so just be careful about that because Nicholas is a very accomplished young man. He just got his master's. He's a teacher in Katy. He teaches engineering. He's brilliant. Um, but he was a victim of that. And he does do that inappropriate staring. Um, so anyway, just a thought. Go ahead, Jennifer. Sorry. But you know, even when you said that, you know, um, that somehow that somebody told you that it um, making eye contact makes them sick to their stomach. That kind of makes me, takes me back to that video that I was just talking about. The kid, yeah. that, that tactile response made him gag. It's the same type of thing for this visual um, processing for him, like was making that same response. It's just, it, to me, it's really interesting. It is fascinating. All this works, but all right. So a couple of things to try with those um, is um, natural lighting windows. See, I'm like that. I hate fluorescent lights. If you're in my office, you can kind of tell it's a little bit dark behind me. I've got some lamps and I got a window. I have my fluorescent lights off. I hate them. Um, uh, decrease visual distractions, um, hide clutter and bins or curtains um, or behind curtains. That's a big thing too, because I mean, this, a lot of this for this visual processing, it reminds me of ADHD <laughs> um, because it's really, kind of similar with some of this the clutter just kind of stops you from doing anything um mm -hmm. but then colored light bulbs or light dimmers can be helpful as well um on the opposite end of that those kids with that high threshold uh, difficulty locating items among other items um i think my husband has this and my children um you know because mom can go and find it but it's you know right there exactly where i told him but all they see is you know they see the forest not the trees um, loses place when they're copying from something from the board um, back to their paper or went from the book to their paper. Um, they often confuse their left and right. Um, I thought this one was kind of interesting too. They tend to write at a slant. So either up, um, slanted up or down on a page. And then just difficulty with um, jigsaw puzzles and things like that. So um, some interventions for that would be to choose um, bright colors and patterns to provide more visual stimulation in the environment for them. Um, it said to use the rope lighting um, and then visual contrast whenever um, possible. And then of course, um, the visual cues on the paper. All right, next. If you're ever on CKC's uh, campus, take a look at their sensory room. It's really great. And they have some great lighting and I just love it when I go, there's general ed teachers on, in this district that do the rope lighting. And it's just, it just makes it for such a lovely work environment, you know? That's, and whenever I was um, the past teacher here at the high school, that's one of the things, um, I had no windows in my room and um, I just had, I think three or four fluorescent lights and they were so just, it just gave me a headache. So I bought these things that would go actually inside, like you open up the the light cover and they go inside and the one that I got was clouds and it just filtered out that harsh light and it gave me like a sense of just it was just better for me um, yes but those things I mean they got I thought I'd ordered a pack of four but um because it was like 50 bucks for the one that I ordered and I was it got there and it was just one and I was like well that's the only one we're getting oh my gosh yeah that's the only one we were getting they have some cheaper ones but that one was um the one that I got was not you um, can say they do have like covers, not, not that go inside, yes. but outside. A lot of teachers have those. Yes. Um, okay. So the gustatory, the taste um, processing. So um, the low threshold is picky eaters. Um, yes. And then they usually have very extreme food preferences. So these are your kids that bring their lunch every day and they bring the exact same thing every day and they're going to eat just that. They will not eat anything else. Um, and they will not eat if there is, if, they forgot their lunch or if something, you know, is wrong with their lunch. Um, a lot of times they'll just eat soft or kind of like pureed foods. Um, it's, it's a whole, 
it's a whole thing, not wanting to swallow any of that. May gag with textured food, um, has difficulty with sucking, chewing, yeah. and swallowing. Okay, so a couple of things is just to begin mm -hmm. adding textures to the diet slowly mm -hmm. um, as the child tolerates it. Um, you may need to get with a, a speech therapist or an OT for more information on some um, ad more advanced techniques. They have some different things that you can do um, to try to start adding things in, but this is a process, like it is a long process when you start, um, when you start working on that. Um, for the high threshold, kiddo. Let me just say something real yeah. quick, Jennifer. Um, I heard somebody say this years ago, and I found it to be true, that usually the picky eater issue, the softer prairie food, the crunchy food or salty food or whatever, it usually gets better um, unless it's like a, um, a physical motor issue. And I think that it's usually kind of like the only control they have over their world because we tell kids what to do, when to eat, when to do it, where they're going to eat, what they're going to eat. And it's like that's their little way of controlling. But I had a, I heard a, an expert say years ago that you really don't see this in middle school. They usually grow out of it. So, um, you know, again, unless it's a, a motor issue, don't get hung up on, you know, because, I mean, you can get hung up on anything you want. But what I'm saying is, it usually gets better. Deanna. Hi. So yeah, I was actually thinking about that myself since I have, you know, the littles, um, right. We're getting them right from the start. So it's hard to distinguish from us if they're not identified, if this is, you know, is this a spectrum, uh, thing, or is this just, it's their age group. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm constantly at, you know, odds on how do I, how do I correct it? Or maybe it's something that they need um so, when I, so are I you talking about the picky eaters issue is that what you're well, talking about all of these all of these processes um processings in general like I've been yeah. um I've been seeing a lot of that but I don't necessarily think that they may be on the spectrum that however that's not my department um, yeah. I have a four-year-old myself and I see some of these tendencies so do yeah. we correct it or do we let them self-soothe with it like that's just kind of where I'm at with it as long as yeah. they're functioning in the classroom yeah yeah I mean I think you just you pick your battles you know right. Pick your battles. Right. yeah I think I mean, it goes back to the quirks versus deficit type yes. of mm -hmm. thing so mm -hmm. it's like is it just something that is quirky or is it interfering with their day-to-day -day life and becomes Absolutely. a deficit so I think that's where you have to kind of really look at what um, the difference is because I think like you said you know when I started this part of it there's going to be pieces in it that we all Absolutely. recognize in ourselves you know, as but my concern is that the gen ed teachers aren't very susceptible or, um, so I guess, what's the best word to use? I don't want to sound like salty, but I you know, they're not, I you know what I mean? They're, they're kind of, they're not all like that gen ed teacher that's like, oh, I don't care that they're over there twirling. Yeah. They're listening. They're, they're retaining all this. So that doesn't matter. So I'm okay. just trying to look for ways to, to kind of say, okay, well, <laughs> So, so I, I, I hear what you're saying and I completely That's understand it. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, in the very beginning, these kids aren't going away. Um, the, it hasn't gone away. It's getting, it, it increases year by year. Um, when I started out in this field, it was like one in 10,000, like autism people, I'd never heard of it. It's one in 45 in the U S it's one in 37 boys. So they're not going away. And like I said earlier, I think it's time for us to change our behavior versus expecting kids to become neurotypical when they're not and they have a neurological disorder. So maybe one good thing for you to do would be to show them this, right? Maybe go over the handout or maybe go over the PowerPoint or show them the, the, the sensory toolbox and how, because you've got to pick your battles, especially now in classrooms. Are you kidding? You're going to worry about the kid who tore, I mean, Show me anybody in any classroom that's not struggling socially. Forget the special ed or at Jenna ed. It's just, it's a nightmare. So, I mean, I don't know if that helped you, Deanna, but. Um, so it kind of did. And, it, you know, that was one of my ideas is just to, to kind of coach, coach us all. Model. Um, okay, so here's people. what I would well, do. I would... For, for your friend, what was his name? Tommy? Like. Tom. That's kind of where we're at with some of our friends. So. Yeah. Model, model, model. Remember that adults like reinforcers too. So when you see the teacher doing something that you have modeled, make sure you pay attention to it and call it out and go, oh, I love the way you did that. Model, model, model. If, if they do, you know, let's say you ask them to do an accommodation and you find that they did it, consider a sonic drink on Friday. Like it works with everybody. And I do that. <clears throat> I try to do that with teachers and parents all the time is catch them doing something good so I can build that 
rapport. Same thing we do with kids, right? And so just don't forget adults need reinforcers too. So see if you can catch them being good and really call them out, like make a big deal at a, a faculty meeting or something like that. So hopefully that okay. helps. Yeah. That was great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Jennifer. All right, so high threshold, you're gonna see these kids that lick, <laughs> they taste or they shoot, they put all kinds of different things in their mouth. Um, they like all the hot spicy foods, like that just intense flavor. So your hot Cheetos and Takis and st although I feel like all kids kind of like those now. I don't um, know. But uh, I know that I'm not a fan. Um, but they're frequently chewing maybe on their clothes. Um, it got, they've got their hair in their mouth, um, sucking on their fingers, things like that. Um, and then they act as if all foods taste just the same. So a couple of things, some interventions, um, vibration in and around the mouth. One of the things I don't think I, I may not have put it on here, but um, that's on the list is getting um, one of the vibrating toothbrushes for them um, as something to put in their mouth. And it really just stimulates that form. Um, crunchy and chewy foods that help alert and organize the mouth. Um, drinking from a water bottle at their desk, providing that form. And then chewing on um, rubber tubing placed on the end of a pencil. Um, and I've... Sorry, Jennifer, can I interrupt? I've seen people do that and they kind of get, and it kind of gets gross because it gets slobbery and it's a hygiene issue, particularly now. So there's a company called Chewlery. It's yeah. like jewelry, but chewelry, like chewing. And they have a lot of different bracelets and necklaces um, because that rubber tubing, I think, yeah, is I a good idea in non COVID days. But yeah, in non-COVID days. Well, and you know, that jewelry you can get off Amazon really pretty cheap. And yeah, I saw like a, a four pack the other day for like 10 bucks. Yeah, um, yeah. They look like little Lego pieces um, mm -hmm. for them just to chew on. Um, another thing, you know, my son, he, I've been, he's been doing this a lot. The, I don't know where he's getting them all from, but they're having them at school doing different things. Those those bracelets, those little rubber, you know, that they're like cancer, like breast cancer awareness. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's got them all on his arm and he's constantly got one off and in his mouth just chewing on it. I'm like, dude, it's driving me crazy. That's what, that's the auditory thing that drives me crazy, that chewing of that. But uh -huh. I used to work with a young man who couldn't stand the sound of people's lips smacking together. Oh. And so I, the first time I met him, I didn't know this and I was chewing gum and he was like, are you chewing gum just to annoy me? <laughs> no, Trent, no, not at all. And he's like, there's a toilet. I mean, there's a trash can in the bathroom on the left. Please throw it away. I'm like, okay. And even to this day, he just can't sit. He slept in his closet for the first seven years of his life because of the crickets. Oh, bless mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Okay. Okay, so the next one is olfactory smell processing. So the low threshold is um, they react negatively or just like smells which do not usually bother or get noticed by other people. Um, my husband teases me because I have a, a low threshold and I notice a lot of different smells like before anybody else smells it, I smell things, but I also, I have migraines. So that stuff triggers me. So I, I notice it. Um, but refuses to eat certain foods just because of, excuse me, because of the way they smell. Same thing, like Susan was saying earlier, like, you know, they may decide they don't like somebody based on the way that they smell or what they wash their clothes and things like that. Um, doesn't tolerate the smell of cleaning products. Um, a couple of things to try. Um, you can use some different calming scents. And again, it's going to be different for all kids. Um, and then, um, so like aftershave, almond extract, lavender, um, one of the things to keep in mind is to keep paint supplies, um, markers, um, class animals. Like I thought that was like, you know, you may not really think about it, but that could really bother, like you had a little gerbil or whatever in the, in the, um, corner that could really kind of set them off, like because of the scent that they have or the, that their cage has or the shavings that are in there. Um, so maybe keeping that on the other side of the room and then just be aware of um, intermittent smells that may be bothersome. So like when you're going to lunch or when um, people come in or when they're mopping out in the hall, um, things like that. Um, high threshold. So that means that, you know, they're needing the more, um, needing more. So they just have, you know, a hard time kind of telling between the different smells, uh, any unpleasant odors, they're not really noticing or picking up on it. Um, they use smell to interact with objects and um, they identify, they, they're unable to identify like from the snacks, scratch and sniff stickers. 
thought that was kind of cool. I hadn't really ever thought of that as being kind of a test for this, but that's something that that's something that you can kind of try to see if they're low threshold or high thresh, um, threshold. Um, a couple of interventions would be to use some alerting scents, so like basil, chocolate, coffee, um, lemon. Um, provide different smell experiences, enrich tasks with scented lotions, fragrant, fragrances, essential oils on a cotton ball, um, and then encourage a daily um, cleaning routine, um, pine saw, or any of those fabulous, those types of things to help kind of with that. Um, all right, next is the vestibular processing. Um, our low threshold kiddos, they are going to um, avoid the playground equipment, okay? This is, they don't really want to do any of that. They want these slow moving um, sedentary, sedentary tasks. They don't really, they're super cautious. They're kind of sitting by themselves a lot um, at recess. Um, they may physically cling to an adult they trust. They turn their whole body to look at you and suggest their neck. They're feel fearful of activities which require good balance. Okay, so some things that you can try is slowly rocking in a rocking chair, kind of building up some tolerance for that. Um, car rides with the seat belt real snug. Um, and then just kind of any activities um, to increase that um, postural control, um, strength and dynamic balance. Um, the high threshold, these are those kids that are just always going, always moving, can't sit still. Um, they crave the tiggers, that. tiggers of the world. The tiggers, yes, crave that fast spinning, intense movement. Um, thrill seekers, dangerous. They like the sudden or quick movements. So some interventions are some just supervised gross movement activities. So running in place, the mini trampoline. You know, I hadn't thought about that, but I'm like, why? Why? Like I should. I would think that we would see more of those in classroom with some of those just jumping yeah. in place, um, uh, bouncing, you know, on the yoga ball, sitting on the yoga ball and bouncing. Um, any kind of classroom movement, the air cushions, yoga balls, those tea stools, and then outdoor activities such as like swimming, swinging, biking, hiking, that kind of stuff. And I like the ball chairs, you know, it's not because it's sometimes it's kind of hard to balance on a, a yoga ball, but those ball chairs can, can be really useful to these kind of kids. Right. All right. All right. So this is that uh, proprioception, the input from the muscle and joints that we were talking about. So this is the heavy work. Um, and so any kind of um, activity that involves the large muscle group. So these are just a couple ideas um, to use in different areas. So in the classroom, they can stack the chairs at the end of the day or unstack the chairs in the morning. Um, wash the desk, um, wash the board. Used to, you know, it'd be like the, the erasers back in my day. <laughs> back in board. my day too. You know, that kind of stuff. Any kind of busy work that is involving um, all like the large muscle groups, having them up moving. Um, you know, one of the things that we said, you know, was um, that we use is for a little guy, he picks up the desk and then puts it back down and picks up the desk and puts it back down. Um, some snack breaks would be good. Um, they can be a crunchy foods, any kind of like dry cereal or vegetable crackers, things like that. Chewy foods like Twizzlers and Starburst, things like that. And then allow gum chewing. Saudi actually had mentioned that earlier. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, Ali said they use the trampoline. Um, I saw that. Yeah. Um, let's see what else. Classroom activities, sharpening pencils, like with like a manual sharpener, not the big one or the one that you just put in there, like a manual sharpener where they're actually moving um, both um, the pencil and the pencil sharpener. Um, stapling papers or stapling things up on the wall, again, where they're having to utilize those large muscles. Um, classroom exercises, push against the wall, chair push-ups. Um, hallway um, activities would be let them open the door for people, hold the doors open, push the lunch cart um, or carry the lunch bin. And kind of, we kind of talked about that with my little guy carrying the bin and then you like your story with them pushing the, the cart down. So um, some things to do at home would be yard work, raking leaves, um, pulling weeds, things like that outside involving the large muscle groups. Um, blowing bubbles, pillow fights. I thought that was a fun one. That is a good one. And uh, what I've been told by people who are smarter than me with this um, stuff is um, when in doubt, always try pro. Yeah. And so if you don't know the kid well enough to know if they are 
low threshold or high threshold or whatever, you kind of can't go wrong with proprioceptive input. Yeah, I like that. All right. Do you want to go? Um, do you want to? You're, we're good. You mean do this part or you do it? Do it? Uh, you can do this part. Okay. So we talk a lot about sensory diets. And, um, you know, it's just a strategic use of sensory activities where you're just scheduling sensory activities. It's not a diet like you're eating something or doing something. It's just this, it's a strategic, thought out, systematic way to give kids input in a functional way, right? So like pushing the cart to bring notes to the, the nurse or carrying the lunch basket with the lunch that the, the weighted. It's to uh, plan. It's a plan to meet the sensory needs of students with sensory processing deficits. I always suggest that you talk to the OT. Um, the goal is to have the student better organize, organize their nervous system for work behavior and achieve optimal attention levels for learning. This will also help engage in social interactions and develop more complex skills. So again, I'm not an OT. Jennifer's not an OT, but I don't know how many we have in the district. How many like two? One. We have one, one OT in the district. So you know, this could give you some ideas so that you don't have to talk to the, um, you know, it's trial and error. It's just like behavior. Behavior is a science, but it's not an exact science. So it's all about trial and error. And I can't tell you the number of days I go in a classroom and I go, I try something and I'm like, that didn't work. Don't do that. Don't do what I just did. Right. <laughs> you know, and so, um, um, so each sensory, some things to remember, each sensory personality is specific, like we've been talking about, like a fingerprint. And you know, we've been talking, we've all been talking about quirks that we have. Um, there's no cookie cutter answer. Uh, works one day, may not work another day. And that's, that's how behavior is too. It's not a sprint, but a marathon. So um, have a continuum so that the individual can fluctuate within a continuum throughout a period of days, hours, weeks, years, even minutes. Fluctuations can be caused by changes in routines, context, stress level, changes in sleep patterns, lack of sleep, medication, illness, biological needs. Be patient. It takes time to change behavior, change behavior. And I have people often ask like, well, how long do I have to do dot, dot, dot? And there's no answer. You know, how long, how long does it take to change behavior? It depends on how long the kids have the behavior in their repertoire, right? It's a lot easier to train to three-year-old's behavior than a 13-year-old's. So with a three-year-old, you know, we're probably going to be consistent for a couple of weeks. For a 13-year-old, it might take months. So we just don't know. But just try one thing at a time. It's like, um, you know, like I had a lot of sinus infections this year since the freeze. And, you know, they just, they just, you know, pound you with all kinds of medications. And I didn't like to take, I, I don't like to take medicine. So I would take, I would do one thing at a time. Like, obviously I would take the antibiotic, but in terms of nose, nasal sprays and, you know, inhalers and all the stuff, I, I wouldn't do all of them like they prescribed because I wanted to do one at a time to see which one was having the best effect. And, you know, that happens a lot with kids is that we're doing so many, we're th throwing so many things at them and then the behavior gets better. We don't know what improved it. So we have to kind of take it slow. Um, we could do combined interventions, of course, like positive reinforcement and visual schedules. But if you're going to look at sensory stuff, try one thing at a time so you'll know what's working. Um, but again, you're going to likely have to try implementing the strategy or tool several times before determining whether it works. And consistently, consistently, consistency is key. Take data to help determine if the strategy is, re strategy is reducing the problem behaviors. If it's working, the st student's engine will be running just right. Um, and so I think that those are all really good reminders with regard to any intervention, whether it be sensory or behavioral or communication or social. Um, so those are some good things to remember. Just remember, these are general recommendations and do not include all of the therapeutic interventions available to address all areas of sensory processing. As with any new activity recommendations, at any activity or recommendations, be sure to just know if your student has a history of seizures or other medical issues and use appropriate precautions and supervision. Ask your district your OT if you are unsure. Watch behaviors, write them down and write them down like exactly what you saw, you know, like Jennifer and I were talking earlier. Assault. Oh, no, I guess we were talking about not online. I mean, not in this. Assault. I had to say a teacher describe a second grader as he was assaulting her. Hmm, really? What was he doing? You know, let's talk about assault. 
or this little girl who's in first grade has inappropriate sexual behaviors. Okay, so what does she do? Well, when she wants to get out of work, she'll say, you just want to have sex with me and run out of the classroom. I'm like, she's in first grade. She has no, and her, she, her family speaks another language. She's not saying, she's not being sexual. She's just saying what has worked for her in the past. Um, or I hate you. I, I love you. And they take all this offense and it's like, give her the word. She, we have to use the word. So when people say inappropriate sexual behavior or assaulting behavior, I would say, what does that look like? <laughs> right? What does that look like? What does that look like? Until I can get it down to where it is. He hits people on the arm with an open hand, uh, open palm with enough force that people can hear it 10 feet away or something like that. But saying he's aggressive or he's you know, inappropriate doesn't really give us any information. And that's a whole nother topic for another day. But what, to consider what's happening in the environment when the behaviors occur. And you can always ask the kid. Like you can always say, hey, are you overwhelmed? Because a lot of kids can tell you it's too loud in here or the lights are too bright. Um, you know, so those are just some other things to, con to consider. Think outside the box, be creative. Um, you don't, it doesn't, <laughs> this is with everything. Like your visual schedules, they don't have to be pretty and laminated and velcro. It just, I mean, I have people who use refrigerator and stove boxes for, you know, a sensory kind of intervention. They really want a TP, but they can't afford it. And so they just get an appliance box from Big Best Buy and put lights inside that, you know, um, it's just changing the environment. It's really not, um, it's not meant to be expensive. You could even have kids make it as a class project, like glitter bottles, stress balls, just get creative um, and think outside the box. Cause a lot of our kids, I mean, all of our kids have really different needs and we've got to be able to meet those needs. The, the traditional classroom really doesn't exist anymore, particularly this year. And I don't know that it ever will again um, because of COVID, but also because of the diversity that we're seeing in classrooms. I mean, I've got two kids on the spectrum. One is having sexual identity issues and is suicidal. And another one is homosexual and suicidal. Um, that's a whole different ball game than reading, writing, and arithmetic, right? It's, it's, it's way beyond... And so we're really trying to help them. Um, they're fine academically, but those other things. I did actually did some research. It's really interesting that girls with autism are like five times more likely to have sexual identity issues than just a typically developing girl. I haven't done a lot of research, but that was something that I found really fascinating. So I digress. I am just getting off on all kinds of tangents. Um, That's interesting. Also no, I hadn't heard that. Yeah, I, I, I'll, if I think about it, I'll send you the article. Yeah, because I'm, I'm thinking of the girls that I've worked with with autism, and I, I could see that. So, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, you're fine. So consider your timing. Once you determine what the co what's causing the sensory behavior and are ready to try an intervention, think about when you should do this, um, when you should implement this strategy. It should, should it be before an activity that's difficult to help them organize for work behavior or should it be during or should it be after non-preferred activities? And, and I don't think there's one answer. You know, I think for some kids, we're gonna front load them and do it and, talk, and you know, front load them ahead of time. Some kids might need to sit on that ball chair during an activity. And then some kids maybe get a reward, um, you know, some sensory intervention as a reward. I'm not a big fan of using sensory as a reward because I don't think it should be contingent on anything. I think it should just be a part of their day, but that's just my, my opinion. Gotta have boundaries. Um, you are ho our whole world should be first then, when then, first then, when then, first then, when then, first then, when then, because we have to teach parameters. And if it's something they like, it's not free. Nothing's free, right? So. You know, they want to jump. Oh, you want to jump? Okay, first sit, sit, sit in chair and then jump. Or no, not sit in chair. First um, clean up, then work. Or I mean, first clean up, then jump. I had a little girl today and um, she was really cute. And we were just kind of pulled her and doing some stuff in the sensory room. And um, she didn't want, I wanted her to write her name and she didn't want to. And I was like, okay, but she liked the swing and she liked the turtle, this little sequency turtle that Jennifer mentioned. And um I said, okay, okay, and, and when the timer goes off, we're going to write our name, and she didn't want to, and I said, okay, listen, first write name, then swing, and so she didn't write her name, she just wrote, I, she copied the letter T, 
And then I said, oh, good, you got the swing. Do you want the swing? And she goes, of course. And so she got back in the swing, precious little thing. But, you know, grandma's rule um, is first eat your green beans, then you get dessert. First, you can do your reset to your homework, then you can go outside. That should be your whole day. Your entire day is first, then, when, then. Notice I don't say if, then, because I know kids who, if I said, well, if you write your name, then you can swing in the swing, and they'll go, well, what if I don't, right? So it's always if, then, I mean, when, then, sorry, and first, then. That's your whole life. Songs are great um, with regard to um, pr um, uh, uh, transitions. Fidgets are great. Timers, we gotta have those timers. They're amazing. Timers work really well. And then, you know, talk to each other. We all benefit from each other's experiences. Um, what time is it now? It is um, yeah. 1.56. Okay, so what I thought we could do is take like 15 minutes to take care of your personal needs, but also to go through um, those seven areas. You don't have the handouts though, do you? Okay, well, let's go back and just review the seven areas. Can we put it in the chat, Jennifer? Uh, yep, I can do that, hang on. We'll put the sensory toolbox in the chat and that way you'll have it and you'll see that there's a lot more resources, I mean, a lot more ideas than the ones that um, we presented, but um, we'll take 15 minutes and go through those, not, you don't have to go through all seven areas, but go through some areas where you see this really, really, really shine at your, at your or really stand out to you about some of your kids. And then be prepared to share. So we'll come back and we'll share um, different ideas that you generated for different kids. So again, we all learn from each other. We all benefit from each other's experiences. And so take a look at the toolbox and we will uh, come back in say 15 minutes. So let's say nothing Siri, uh, to 12 and then we'll wrap things up. Thanks no, you guys. No. I'll get that in the um, chat in just a second. Okay, thanks, Jennifer.
longer you are walking on the child by the water, you're going home. I don't see anything in the chat that shows. I don't see anything in there. Can you turn off your mic, please? Deborah, I think it's you. I'm not sure. I Thank thought you. I was mute. I thought I was mute.
All right, friends and family, we are ready to roll. So go ahead and turn back on your camera. We want to see everybody's beautiful faces before we finish up today. Um, I put the link in um, the chat. So she right. actually had it. Um, she's another, another one of our humble um, former humble peeps. So I'm sure that's probably where you got it from, huh, Shadrina? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Did you go to this, the training that they actually did with the um, sensory toolbox? Uh, they, I think so, because we had autism um, teams for each campus and yes, we all had did. together. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't remember. I got it whenever I was there. It wasn't as a team. Um, we didn't have like a team like that um, at that point a long time ago, but I, I, going to this training with, it was um, an OT and I think a BCBA. It was Laura, Laura Dowdy and uh, Chris, um, Cindy uh, Cornwell, now Cindy Castro, I think. Yeah. And um, I was actually a consultant for them and I attended part of a training and um, they, um, they, you know, Emble is a great district. They are just really light years ahead of, or they were, I'm not sure if they still are because I don't work there anymore, but they were really light years away ahead of other districts. So especially their yeah. special ed um, area is, yeah, it is awesome. So, uh, you know, we're working hard to try to kind of catch up to some of that. And, you know, really, you know, I think I've mentioned this earlier, I didn't, I, maybe I didn't, I work in about 12 or 13 school districts right now. And um, I just told Jennifer, we were talking about how this has been a really tough year. And honestly, Crosby was is my happy place, <laughs> so it's not as bad as you might think it is. I uh, just want you to know that that um, you guys, Deer Park, um, are really my happy places, and there are other districts where I work that are, you know, what shows. And so I'm sure you think that this is a you know what show, but just trust me when I say it 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 it's not, <laughs> it's not nearly as much as it is in other places. So having said that, to wrap things up, who would like to share some information about your kid without giving anything away, anything that's confidential? Um, talk about your kiddo and or what you might do. Who would like to start? We need three, three volunteers today before we can go. That'll get everybody going. <laughs> yeah. Deanna. Sorry, my video wasn't starting. Okay, so I was thinking about my caseload this year and my little neighbor, bless her heart, she's super creative and I'm glad she's doing this so she stays out of trouble. Um, she was making these little um, you know, sensory bottles and she didn't realize it at the time because she was like, you know, second grader, she's like, oh, look at this cool and I'm all about reduce, reuse, recycle. Okay, so, love and the kids love this. They love the feeling of the beads or the rock. I mean, you can even put some some academic stuff in there, you know. This is um, your 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 neighbor's daughter. It's my neighbor. Like, I actually had a sit down conversation with her. I'm like, could you make me some more of those? And I super glued the top, and I didn't have to buy anything. She wanted to make them. She was all like, "Oh, I'm I'm Miss Hedges' teacher helper. She's my little neighbor." But yeah, that's so, wonderful. Recycled products, and there's glitter in here. I don't know if you can tell. I'd probably go with more glitter because who doesn't like more glitter? <laughs> I love it. That's a thought. And are you having, do you have any kids who like those or use those? Oh yeah. This is a first and then this is a, I need a break then this is, we use it for multiple purposes. Um, so, and, and so, really cool. when you, so when you go back to the sensory toolbox and you think about vision, would that be for a kid who's under aroused or over aroused? Um, and I don't mean to give you a trick question. I'm just curious. No, I, I, yeah, no, it's, well, for me, it depends on, it depends on the situation and how they're utilizing it. Sometimes they just need that, that little brain break. So they'll, they'll just watch it fall. And I use my bubble. Let me show you my bubbles. Just a minute. Whoever's at my door. One second. All right. If you want to just drop it and go, I'll get it in a second. Sorry guys. Okay. And then I've got these. I know a lot of teachers on campus use these that aren't even with special needs children. Um, I've got my little hourglass. I'll say if they need a sensory break, they'll watch it, or maybe that this is my little timer. I've got so audio. Would probably be kids that would be under aroused in the visual area. I was just kind of going back to the shape, the, the toolbox. So yeah, that's great, Deanna. So, I love those ideas. Thank you. Anything else? Ideas. 
Um, I'm looking around. I mean, of course, we use a lot of visual cues, but yes, as far as like something they could see, look, touch, not a whole lot to taste. We we try to stay away from yeah from that with the candy and everything, especially this time of year. There's plenty of that. Yes, <laughs> but yes. um. So I'm just kind of looking around and see what I have. Uh, well, auditory, even even if they aren't hearing impaired, I've been using some of the whisper phones because yeah. some of them like to hear them while talking. And it yeah, out that, uh, tell everybody what you teach. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, I'm the inclusion teacher at CKC. So um, I've had uh, quite a few of uh, autistic kids along the way, even outside of teaching. I have one, my stepson is autistic. Um, and I have a, a lot, a daughter that has a reading disability. So yeah, that's, I I've come up with all these ideas and, and my little you. neighbor friend, she's her best friend. So it's like, this is great. That's amazing. Thank you, Gina. I met you in the hallway today, right? Yes, you did. Yes, you okay. did. Nice, <laughs> great to, see you. nice to meet you. Thank you for sharing all of these wonderful ideas. <laughs> Two more people to share about sensory over, uh, um, the high sure. threshold, low threshold, and some strategies. Two more. Sure. Who else would like to share? Yay, Miss Metter. What do you got? You got my name right. Um, I have, uh, so when we sit down to work, I have a box. I have for first then. Hang on. Love it. So they know when they sit down, they have to produce work. And so I have... Um, for all different, you know, for seeking and avoiding. Where are you, Miss Metter? What campus? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm a CES life skills. Okay. That's right. 82, we can see behind you your um, your things covering your window. Light covers. Cover. Yeah, your light covers. <laughs> They're good for migraines too, FYI. Yes, yes, they are. <laughs> so I have like bubbles, you know, fidget toys, just anything, but they know that they have to produce the work and then when they're done, they get to play. Um, awesome. It, you know, just, I mean, it can be anything as easy as this. Um, but um, so then that way I'm, I'm reaching all areas. I have visual timers, um, auditory timers, but um, I find it beneficial to have the fidget toys. So then that way they know first you work, then you can play. Yeah, um, absolutely. So that's all I have. So good, Miss Metter. And you know, um, I, I was going to tell you, Dean, I had uh, your friend today in the sensory room and just fell in love, of course, precious, precious one. And one of the things that worked for her was using my timer on my phone. And I would tell her to press start. And then when the timer went off, I would tell her to press cancel. And she seemed to respond really well to that. So just a little thing, you know, and she liked that turtle with the sequence on it. And she really liked the swing. Like she almost fell asleep in the swing. Yeah, and the so just, and she like puzzles. So I found a puzzle that's not just you know your basic connecting one. It like spins around, and you can do several different sides. It's kind of more like a baby toy, but it has a sensory touch to. Yeah. Um, you know, so and the then swinging, it, we she really responded to the swinging, and she liked that. She liked the jumping too. We get. I went out the trampoline, and she jumped, and I counted, and then I counted to ten another time, and then I said, "You count," and she jumped and counted. And she's got some pretty. She's got some skills, but she's also got some deficits. So I wish every campus had a sensory room like I do too. <laughs> write a grant. Write a grant. That's how most of my people yeah. get them. They write grants. We uh, did uh, social stories this year, but next year I'm going to. Good. Good. Is that Miss Mater that was just talking? Yes. Hey, hi, Katie. Um, real quick, I have a trampoline. It's it's one of those mini ones. Mm -hmm. Would it fit in your classroom when when Lucas outgrows it? Because he'll outgrow it real soon. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, we don't have and a trampoline. It's, uh, it's covered, so they won't fall out or anything. Nice. Yeah, that'd be great because we don't have one here, so that would be great. Yes. Nice. Somewhere in my garage. Okay, we'll get together soon. Thank you. So good. No awesome. Thank you, Kit Deanna. Thank you, Karen. Who else? One more person, and then we'll be done for the day and the week. I'll share a strategy that um, the new SLC teacher at uh, Newport just used. We had an issue. She's phenomenal, um, by the I way. I can't tell who's talking. It's Allie. Oh, hey, Allie. Hi. Hi. Thanks for being here. So, yeah, of course. She is phenomenal. She so impressed with her. Um, she So the other day I was in there and she was she said the day before during circle time, she was having issues with the, some of the students keeping them their hands to themselves. Some of them are putting them down their pants or some of them are touching mm -hmm. others. 
So what she did during circle time is just like she drew the first day, she just traced their hands on the table with like mm-hmm. a expo marker. Mm-hmm. And then when I was in there the other day, she was actually cutting out their handprints to put them as a visual there. So it was just like a cool, it was really cool to see how um, it was a new behavior that just popped up that she's dealing with. And she just thought on the spot, well, let me come up with a visual. And she said that it has worked um, really, really well over the past couple of days. It's so good. And you, you guys are so blessed this year. You've got such good teachers and all the important and all the, the places, but um, yeah, just showing kids what to do with their hands, you know, because I think teachers, we parents, teachers, whoever spend a lot of time saying, no, 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 don't, put, don't stop that. Don't put your hands in your pants. No, 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 no. And I always joke and think, I say this a lot too. Um, I'm sure they've been told no at least 600 million times so far, and it hasn't worked. So you just show them what to do. So instead of saying no running, we say walk, please. Instead of saying no hands in the pants, we say hands go here, working hands, you know, and it's so simple to just change your language to tell kids what to do instead of what not to do. Because I always, I just think it's so funny that when, you know, the kid's been spitting since he was in first grade, he's in sixth grade and he gets a sixth grade and Jenna, the teacher, especially the teacher goes, no spitting, like like, just because you've said it, it's really going to work. Like, he's been told no a lot, and it hasn't worked. Let's come up with something else, so. Well, it just goes back to your point where, you know, we've been trying, we're trying to make them change, make all these changes where it's much, we're the flexible ones. It's much easier for us to change our language and the way that we work with them. Um, yeah, it's it's time. Know, yeah, and, and I don't want to get on a soapbox again because I feel like I do it a lot, but it really is time. And, and here's the thing, you guys. If you have a four-year college degree and are on the spectrum, one in five people are employed. So that means 80% of people who have a four-year degree in autism are graduating to the couch. That's a problem. That's a problem. If you have an intellectual disability, you're, it's, it, you, it, 60% of people with intellectual disabilities are part or full-time employed. So you're three times more likely to have a job if you have an intellectual ability than if you have a four-year degree in autism that's a problem. And so, you know, it is time for us to really start changing our behavior and start focusing on what these kids need when they're an adult. And the reason that they're so unemployed is because of the social and some sensory stuff, but the social is really impacting them. And, um, you know, it's never about the academics. It's never about the academics. It's always about the social and behavioral piece. And, you know, I have a young man who I um, is in college. At, well, I think he's in college. He was going to UT in the computer science program. And the reason I know him is because in his freshman year, he tried to commit suicide. And um, I knew him throughout school. And he has, we've remained in contact since he started college. And I cannot find him. His phone's been turned off. And he has a, a mutual friend um, that I also know who's on the spectrum and he can't find them either. I'm very, very worried about it, but um, there's the, that's, that's not okay, right? It's just not okay. And it's 2021, so it's time. And so with that, I hope you all have a fabulous weekend and I will be hanging out on here with Jennifer in case anybody has any specific questions that you wanna talk about that you don't wanna talk about in public or you know with a large group. So. Thank you for being here. Happy Friday. Have I a great want to weekend. One thing real quick, Susan, and this yes, is something that sure. I say, y'all, this is something I say, if you've, if I've worked with you with any AU kids at all, um, you've probably heard me say this, <laughs> but it has stuck with me. It's something whenever I first started working with um, kids on the spectrum that somebody told me, um, and it's kind of my default. It's the visuals, how important the visuals are talking, kind of piggybacking off of what Ali said too. Um, but what, yeah. what was told to me was that when you're working with AU kids to think um, of them as the spoken language, verbal language is not their first language. The exactly. visual is the first language. Okay. So it's like somebody like speaking Spanish to me, I may pick up every couple of words um, and kind of have like the gist of what they're talking about. But um I'm not going to understand it the same way I would if it was my native language. Um, and love so that. It's the same, that has always stuck with me. And so I think that a lot of times too, especially with our high functioning AU kids, um, we 
that they may not be understanding, they may not be getting what we're telling them. Um, and you think because they're older and you know, they're smart and you know, yeah. all this other stuff about them that it's hard to kind of make ourselves, the adults go back to the visuals because mm -hmm. they're like, well, they don't need the picture. They can read. Well, yes, they can read, but again, it is so much about the visual and, and sometimes the visual is just the words themselves, but, yeah. but just that, that visual, um, is it, it's just so important. So like I said, I tell that pretty much anytime I'm working with somebody um, that has an AU kid, like if you, if you're not getting there with them, um, go back to the visuals, back to the basics. Um, and, and that tends to, I, I've seen a lot of su success with that. So yeah. And I love that. I have never thought about that, Jennifer. I love that analogy. And you know, my friend who's in, who used to be an humble, he used to, always tells me, show what you want to say. Yeah. Show what you want to say. And it's the same thing, but I love that English is your, your I mean, uh, verbal is your, not your first language, visual. That's yeah, amazing. It, it stuck with me when she said it and it like, it. it just made so much sense. So, Perfect. um, yeah. Okay. So we'll hang out for a few minutes if anybody has any specific questions or comments, but, um, otherwise, if you feel like you're good to go, happy Friday. Happy Make sure Friday. you've got your email in the chat box if you haven't already. So I can send you, um, cause the link is there now, but if you didn't get it, I will send it. I mean, I'm going to send it out in an email as well. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. Appreciate Thanks, you. Thanks for being here. I have a quick question. I have a kiddo that chews everything, and we've tried all different types of um, fidget, um, <laughs> like the shark tooth. He'll eat through that. I mean, he has teeth of steel. Um, so I didn't know if you guys had any tools up your sleeves to help with that. You know, um, you might... I would talk to the OT, but you might yeah, we, ask them. You can try. <laughs> no. What yeah. about the what about talking to his dentist? What uh, about asking mom if you could talk to the dentist and see if the dentist has any ideas? Okay. I can Does talk the to OT her. nothing. So everything you've tried has worked. Yeah, she gave like this vibrate, like this toy that vibrates that up. Yeah. <laughs> Like he, I have never seen a child chew through things like him. And I thought, oh, I got this shark. I was like, that's just so durable. He won't, and he chewed right through it. Oh, an hour, but he chewed through it. I had to throw it away. Um, but so I didn't know if you guys had any. Does he have a preference to texture over or, or anything like that? Not really. Erasers. Um, I would talk to the dentist. I, I mean, you have to get consent from the parent, obviously, but maybe they they would have some ideas that's that's unusual i've not heard i mean i guess i have heard of that i have had kids write through things but i've i've i mean i had other kids that like they would chew on things but yeah not, not chew it up like he does and like so let me throw this out there does he have pica does so he, he doesn't any? he doesn't eat it he just okay it's like um i guess it's like a, a he just chews it up and then I'll go over and, you know, spit it out. He, I mean, he willingly spits it out. He doesn't care to eat it. He just wants to chew it. He wants that deep pressure um, from it. So I don't know. Oh, that's a tough like, one. Let me try this one. Let me try this one. And every one we try, he through chews through it. So I didn't know if you guys had any. Oh, no, he's, yeah, no, we couldn't do gum. Somebody, I don't have any, but maybe somebody oh. else does. We couldn't do gum. He's. Yeah, that would be everywhere. <laughs> and kids' hair. That would be. Bad. We had a kid in Omo that chilled through everything, too. And I'm trying to remember if we found something. If I think of it, Katie, then I have to let you know. Okay. So we had a kid that kind of did the same thing. They didn't eat it, but they chewed through everything yeah. we gave yeah. them. Yes. What about Legos? Would he chew up Legos? I don't know. Um, he's not really interested in Legos um, too much. But what if he wrapped a Lego around his, like a, a like a necklace? An actual Lego? I'll have to try that and see if that would work. Because I had the chew the jewelry Lego. Yeah. Oh my God. I would really talk to the dentist because that's he, he. I mean that that's got to cause some kind of mm -hmm. something. Maybe he's trying to relieve some pain. That's why I asked mom because he stopped for a little bit and then he started again. And I said maybe he's getting molars, like his six year molars or something, and maybe that's his way of like getting. That's why I'm saying the dentist needs to get involved because okay. I had a girl who was doing a lot of of a lot of just behavior, and I look. We finally looked in her mouth. She let us look in her mouth, and you know those little, 
You know those little tacks that people decorate Crocs with? Mm-hmm. That they do get Crocs. She, she had one in her tooth. Oh, boy. Yeah, so I, that's what I'm thinking. You might want to see if she'll let you have consent to talk to the dentist. Because I, I that concerns me that he's getting too much input. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So try that. Hopefully that'll give you some ideas. Thanks right. so much. All right. Thank you. You guys have You're a good welcome. day. Bye. Anybody else have any questions? Or concerns? I, I think I have a question. It's not really, I have a student, he's a high school, high functioning uh, student. And this is my third year working with him. And he is just, he's one of those kids, like you were saying, he's just not engaged in academics at all. Um, he's very artistic and he has a special skill set, uh, which will hopefully provide him with a career in the future, but he just doesn't have like any motivation and it's becoming like a discipline issue because teachers are sending him out of his class because he's not doing anything. Um, he also doesn't have a lot of credits and, you know, I'm afraid of him dropping out, but, and he, even, he gets annoyed. Like if, you know, any adult is like, well, you know, we're trying to help you. What can we do to help? And like, that's triggering to him. And I just like, I'm at yeah. a loss. Um, so why are they sending him out? Is he disruptive? He's not disruptive, but he's just, they're trying to like, for example, if they're doing group work and he wants to work independently, they'll allow him to work independently, but then he won't work. So the teachers are seeing that as, you know, disrespect and non-compliance <laughs> and are sending him to the office. Um, well, I think we need to figure out what's wrong. It sounds like he could be depressed. Well, so I've been trying to, I've been working with him and I do think that there's some deep rooted things. There's like, you know, he experienced his mom died in a tragic way a couple of years ago and him and he yeah. lived with his dad and dad isn't, but he, you know, it's, these poor kids yeah it's just it's it's a lot more but I'm also like you know trying to back off of the academics and focusing more on right isn't there a credit recovery or something kind of program that he could take and just not worry about the academics and just graduate I mean really or could he do his GR uh, could he do the um what's it called the GED yeah, the GED. I was that's, that's GRE. Kind of what Jessica and I were talking about yesterday, because that's like a one and done. My my fear with the credit recovery is that he wouldn't, he still wouldn't do it because he's mm-hmm. got no, um, there's no, nothing that'll motivate. No motivation. Yeah. yeah. There's no why bother. He doesn't have a why bother. Right. Why would I bother doing this? Why would I bother doing that? Yeah. Right. I mean, I would really try to maybe I'd have a staffing and maybe talk to the teachers about his priorities and you know, it's not a behavior issue, people. Yeah, it's, it's, that's what I keep saying. Experiencing a lot of emotional stuff and maybe just get him, how old, what grade is he in? He's a junior. He's supposed to be a junior. Supposed to be, yeah. I don't think with him, do you really know if he would be able to take the GED? Because I mean, like in three years, there hasn't been much work out of this kiddo, right? So like, I don't even know where we... He's pretty intelligent. Sweet. Okay. Well, what if, yeah, maybe doing that, that um, GED like prep thing, if there's any buy-in for that, if, because it's like only a couple weeks and then take the GED and be done. Yeah. That's what Jessica and I were talking about yesterday, but I'm also like, like, to the other point, I'm concerned about his, what happens after that? Yeah. Yeah, So that's what I was just going to say, Allie, I'm afraid to just set him free. Right. You know? So what if we did I am making some progress with him over the past, I guess, two weeks that I've been working with him. Um, And it kind of hit me. I was like, all right, everybody's talking to this kid about what he's not doing. Let's talk about the things that he loves. And he like lit up and, you know, talking my ear off. And Jennifer heard from the, you know, the other side of the wall. I was like, wow, I've never heard him talk that much. Yeah. (laughs) So, so let me just kind of throw a couple of things out there. Maybe you just get the GRD, GRD, GED prep thing and, you know, maybe try to help him find a job. Yeah. I know Jessica was going to reach out to TWC and see if they had any connections with um, the field of work that he. And that's art? Yeah, it's it's animation. Okay. Yeah, I would do that. Um because he probably will be an animator, right? Like it, that's probably not out of the out of the scope of reality, right? 
And so I, I, I guess I, I, I wouldn't let him go until we knew he was on the right path. But for yeah. me, you know, I, I'm really not worried about academics. I'm worried about social emotion. And that's how I am. And then I think that's why teachers tend to not like me. Like same. <laughs> whatever. They don't <laughs> not like you. <laughs> I'm the like, same though. I, I mean, it's I the same. About the credits. I want to make crazy. sure this kid is, you know, healthy. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. And employable. Yeah. Okay. So we're on, we're thinking on the right track. I think I think so too. And I appreciate you yeah. um, being Thank considerate you. of his needs and not worrying so much about the small stuff. <laughs> Thank you for your thanks, Ali. Appreciate you. Anybody else? All right. Well, um, if you feel you feel like you've got everything you need, then go ahead and you can sign off and leave the meeting. And I hope you have a great year. A great rest of the year and a great weekend. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.